I'm going to read verses 10 through um, 19. And you'll remember uh, we've been talking about Saul. Last week we talked about the calling of Saul and how Saul was a persecutor of the early Christian church. The Christian church called itself the way because they were trying to follow Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. And a place where um, sometimes they were respected and received and other times they were rejected and persecuted. And Paul was one of the chief persecutors of the early Christian church um, as part of the Jewish Sanhedrin, um, the rulers and the authorities in the Jewish church. And uh, he was on a mission. And he decided not only was it good enough for him to persecute Christians in Jerusalem, but he got a letter from the Sanhedrin to allow him to go other places and seek out Christians so that they too could be persecuted. And it was on the road to Damascus um, where God struck him down and um, blinded him and asked him why he was persecuting him. And, um, and after Jesus spoke to him and called him, he was left blind. That's where we pick up the story today. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for the man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and now he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we just thank you and praise you for the life that you have given to us and the call that you have placed on every life in this room. God, I pray that you would give us courage today to take charge of our lives, to make a decision about what we're going to do with the one life that you have given to us. May we be faithful in our choosing. May we be faithful in our living. May we be faithful today to make ourselves aware for your presence, for your word to speak to us. Thank you, God. Amen. Remember the 80s? You know, in some ways it seems like you don't. <laughs> I know you don't. <laughs> in some ways it's, it's hard to think that it was that far back ago. In some ways it's like, oh my gosh, that's like ancient history. But like the 80s, I finished high school in the 80s. I went to college in the 80s. Some of you were getting married and having babies in the 80s. Some of you were getting married again and having more babies in the 80s. <laughs> You know, the 80s, it was a long time ago, and, um, and, and, and if you think about the, the way that technology has changed since then, it's been light years. How many of you typed your papers on a typewriter in college or high school? Yeah. How many of you don't know what a typewriter is and never saw one? <laughs> yeah, you guys probably never touched a typewriter. Let me just tell you, the action's a lot harder than your nice computer keyboard. So computers came a long way. It wasn't until I got to seminary, and um, the, I graduated seminary in 96. It wasn't until the mid-90s that I had my first computer, and it was a hand-me-down with floppy disk and a printer with the little dot things on the edge, and you had to rip it, the papers apart. And you had to pray that that little thing wouldn't get tired of going back and forth. Burr, burr, burr. It would take as much time as it takes to print one page now. Imagine this. It, it, it would take, like, um, that to make one sentence, you know? The printer's now one page, 
It would take that long to do one sentence with those old, yeah, ancient histories. So much more. Oh, right, you're old. <laughs> so I remember when they were first coming out, and I was on a retreat, and I met this woman. She was Italian, and if you couldn't tell by her name, Ana Maria Elena Gonzalez. No, it wasn't Gonzalez. <laughs> Better tell me. We'll just give her something in Italian. Um, if you couldn't tell by her name, you could tell by her accent. I mean, she was really Italian. Not, not American Italian. She was Italian, the real kind from Italy. And she was talking about computers. And she says, these computers, they like your mom. And I'm like, where is this going? You tell it to do something. And they say, are you sure? <laughs> you remember that? You get the little prompt. Do you really want to do this? And you put yes. And then they say, are you really sure? <laughs> well, you know what? Um, I remember those, and, and yeah, they do sound a bit like your mama, and wow, I can imagine Ananias that day, when God spoke to him and said, go to Straight Street, there's a man named Saul there that I need you to go and minister to, that Ananias would have gone, are you sure, God? And what if, maybe he was Italian, are you sure, God? Are you really sure because... <clears throat> Do you have the address right? Straight Street, Judas's house? I heard that Paul, Saul, sorry, he hasn't changed his name yet. I heard that Saul, that man who is persecuting Christians, is staying in that house. Are you sure, God, that that's where you want me to go? What a difficult calling for Ananias. You, you must think that he was kind of fearful because he knew, he had heard that that Saul had persecuted Christians. He had probably heard about Saul being the one who headed up the execution of the apostle um, Stephen. He, he had probably heard that, that Saul had a vendetta against those who were a part of the way, those who were trying to follow after Jesus Christ. You had to imagine that Ananias would have known about this man who was coming with a letter from the high priest so that he could seek out those in Damascus and persecute them too. But as much as Ananias might have had fear of Saul, greater than that was his respect for God. And so when God spoke to Ananias, Ananias went. Now there's something, um, some things that I want us to talk about today that the call of God on a person's life changes. So we know, I mean we already know the end of the story. That the call of God on Saul's life changed him from a persecutor of Christians to probably one of the greatest people that ever lived other than Jesus Christ and had more impact on the Christian church than anybody other than Jesus Christ. Would you agree with that? What polar opposites. That's the kind of stuff that the call of God will do. And I want you to think about the call of God upon your life. Because you might say that's just for preachers or teachers or somebody besides me. But the Word of God calls each and every one of us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. You are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Guess how many days you are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The days after you worked really late the night before and you have a hard time getting up in the morning, those days you're called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The day that you and your spouse had a spat in the morning and you just feel like, at those days you are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The days that you wake up and you go, oh, my body has betrayed me and I can no longer go on with all of this stuff that's happening in my body. Those days, you are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus never promised it would be easy, did he? I do not find that in scripture anywhere. People, people will say, cast all your cares upon the Lord and everything will be hokey pokey forever. I don't think it says hokey pokey in the Bible. But and that is true. Cast your cares upon the Lord and he will relieve you of your burdens. That is true. But he never promises that everything after that is going to be easy. Some people will say, just give your life to Jesus and everything is going to be all right in your life. From then after, you will never suffer. You will never be disappointed. That is just not true. That's not in the Bible. What it says is, give your life to Jesus Christ. He will save you from your sin, and you will spend eternity with him. And 
no matter what happens, He, Jesus Christ, will be with you. That's what it says in the book. Did you see um, how many of you are Facebook followers of Morgan Boston? Yesterday she posted, actually she sent me a text. I was so blessed she sent this to me in a text. It's a picture of Kemper. Was he two years old? And he's sitting in the middle of her bed with her big Bible, her study Bible. And he's flipping through it and he's going, this is my Bible. And she says, what does your Bible say? It says, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. If a two-year-old can figure that out, oh my goodness. You and I better wake up, brothers and sisters, because Jesus Christ has called your name. And he's asking you to be a disciple. There is a call on your life, whether you like it or not. And i got to tell you the truth. I ran from my call to ministry for a very long time. My mama could tell you stories. And um, I remember when um, my college campus minister came to me one day and she said, you know, I think you have gifts and graces for ministry. And I laughed at her. And I said, well, thank you. That's really nice of you to say. But when God says so, I'll do something about it. It was years, 10 years later that I finally said, okay. Well, you know what? If that's the way you have to answer God's call, you're in good keeping. Think about people like Moses. He was a murderer. He had run. He had a terrible st stutter. He was a shepherd out in the middle of the wilderness. And God called him to redeem his people out of bondage in Egypt. God called him to receive the letter of the law. To be one of the very few people that ever physically experienced the presence of God and lived to tell about it. What about David? Who is the greatest king in all of Israel's history? King David. David was an adulterer, and he fell in love with his best friend's wife and had his best friend sent off the battle and had his people kill him so that he could steal his wife. So if you wonder if God can use you, let me just say, heck yeah! God wants people that are not perfect. God wants people who are forgiven and who He can empower. And so there's a few things that um, I want to tell you from this scripture that I glean about what happens when you respond to God's call in your life. First of all, I want you to remember when Ananias first heard that he was supposed to go and see Saul. What, what did Saul's name ring off a bell in his mind? Persecutor. Fear this person. But when God spoke to him and said, go and pray with this man to give his sight back to him and pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon him. When Ananias went to Saul, no longer was he his enemy, but when Ananias prayed for Saul, he called him brother. Brother, the Lord has sent me to pray for you. So when we respond to God's call, one of the changes that happens isn't just what we're dealing with inside of ourselves, but it's the way that other people see us. They recognize, you know, something's going on in that person, and I see, I see how they're clinging to God. I see how they're looking for their scriptures. I see how they're carrying it's little Bible verses in their pocket because they don't know why, but at some point during that day, they might need to pull that out. I see you. I hear about you. I know about you. Other people notice the change that God creates in you. That's one of the things that happens. One of the changes when we respond to God's call is how others see us. Another thing that happens is that God gives us new vision. For Paul, it was dramatic. You know, I hope I never lose my eyesight, not even for a minute. I, that's one of my favorite gifts, my eyes. I love vision. And, and even though I'm getting older and my vision has changed and I'm having to wear glasses now, I used to boast. It was only about 10 years ago that I had to start wearing reader glasses. And I was like, but that's okay. My distance vision is still good. You be careful what you boast about because when you get older, your eyes do too. And, um, and so that is one of the gifts that I treasure most is the gift of sight. I cannot imagine losing it, not for a minute, not for a day, not definitely for three days. For three days, 
But Paul needed those three days, Saul needed those three days, didn't he? He needed those, th those three days to recognize that God was greater than he was. That God's call could be totally opposite of what we thought it was. Because remember, Saul thought with all of his heart that it was the right thing to persecute Christian believers. Because he was sticking up for his faith, his heritage, all the things he'd been taught in his life. God changes our vision sometimes so that we can see that something that we thought was completely untrue is now true. So God gave Saul new vision. Maybe it was scar tissue that fell from his eyes. I don't know. Was it like lightning and it actually burned his eyes? I don't know. The scripture says something fell from his eyes, sort of like scales. You know, to me that doesn't matter. What matters is he opened his eyes and he could see. And I don't think that was just a visual change from darkness to vision. That was a change in his heart that he no longer saw with just his eyes, but he saw with the eyes of the Lord. God, when God calls you, gives you a new vision. The scripture says that when Ananias prayed for Saul, that he prayed not just for his vision to be restored, but he placed his hands on Paul and said, Brother Saul, um, Jesus who appeared to you on the road who, who you saw coming here sent me so that you may see again and be, you remember the rest? Filled with the Holy Spirit. People, guess what? Saul got his own day of Pentecost right there in the house on Straight Street where nobody who was a part of the way wanted to even go that day. Saul not only got his vision back, not only knew he was called, but he had a change that was so drastic it was because of the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon him that day. I read a story about a missionary missionary went to his um, to his assignment overseas and there was a car assigned to that position within the mission and when he got ready to start the car it wouldn't start and so um, what he realized is that he would have to pop the clutch so he went to a school near his home and asked the teachers to let a few students out and they would push his car to get it started and then when he arrived at the next place either he would leave the motor running or he would park on a hill he felt like he had just overcome so much right then by his own wisdom given by God, of course, of course. And he was so excited that he'd figured this out. He, for two years, he popped the clutch. He, he had somebody push him to pop the clutch. He had parked on the hill so he could pop the clutch or leave the car running so he could go again. And at some point within two years, his time ended there. And so the new missionary was coming to take his spot. And so there was a little orientation overlap there with the old missionary and the new missionary. The old missionary says, here's what I figured out about this car. It runs great once you get it started, but I can't get it started. And by that time, the, um, the new missionary had flipped the hood up. And the old missionary is still saying, so I figured out a plan. All you have to do is get these kids from the school. They'll come and push your car. About that time, the new missionary wiggled a little wire and said, I think there's just a loose connection. <laughs> and he stepped into the car and it started right up. <laughs> How many times do we have access to a power that we don't even use? And we devise our own way because we know better, right? It's my life. I know what needs to happen in my life. Well, maybe not. Maybe you need the power from the Spirit of God to direct your life. When you answer God's call, you answer to a higher power, and you are empowered to do what God calls you to do. There's some crafty sayings about God doesn't call the powerful, he powers the called, or something, I don't know. But that's what happens. God will give you grace. God will give you power through the Holy Spirit to do what he's called you to do. Those who are called are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Last thing, fourth thing. At the end of, um, of Paul's stay, um, or at the end, after Paul had been healed and, and, and he had received the Holy Spirit, Saul baptized him right there. 
And baptism is a mark of becoming a part of the community. And it lets us know that no longer are we out there alone fidgeting on our own, trying to figure it out. It lets us know that we are part of something bigger and that we have partners in the work that God has called us to do. Those who are called have entry into the community of faith and you have other laborers to help you answer the call. You are Christ Jesus' disciples. Every one of you are called. When you answer the call, Christ will give you all that you need. You can trust in that. You can trust that when you answer God's call, other people will see you different. You can trust that when you answer God's call, you'll be given new vision. You'll be given spiritual vision so that you will see things not your way anymore, but Christ's way. You can trust that when God calls you and you answer God's call, that His Holy Spirit will provide the power that you need. You can trust that you're not alone. Not only is Christ with you, but you're a part of the body of Christ. So step up brothers and sisters today, and answer the call that Christ has put uniquely on your life. Let us pray. Oh God, help us to trust you. That's such a big problem sometimes. Help us to trust you, to believe in you,